interesting. I think Dave uh, looked at my presentation before he spoke. So it will be a little reinforcement, which is a good thing. Um, and the only journalist joke I know is, uh, what is the difference between a blog and a flog? A flog leaves a lasting impression. <laughs> but Dave's telling us otherwise, and I'll defer to his wisdom. So I was asked to talk about communicating science from a scientist's perspective, and particularly trying to tie it into the areas of concern. And I'd like to start off by talking about next slide. Um, some lessons that I learned working in the Everglades before uh, I moved to Michigan about six years ago. And one, there's some parallels here between working in the Everglades and working in the Great Lakes. There's billions of dollars at stake as a consequence it's very important that scientists be able to communicate their information clearly because those decisions help inform the kinds of management decisions that are made. And if we don't communicate our information clearly, then the wrong decisions can be made and as a consequence, a lot of money can be spent unwisely. There's competing demands, particularly in Florida, for limited amounts of fresh water. And so in that environment, you have, you have to balance the demand between agriculture, the environment, and industry. And although we have plenty of fresh water here in the Great Lakes and in Michigan, we still have competing demands and there are going to be areas of conflict. So we have to be very clear about that. And science is often viewed as the neutral arbiter of conflict. I can't tell you how many times I hear in an audience that what we need to resolve this issue is good science. And what I found is that people define good science as science that backs their position. <laughs> Once it stops backing their position, then it becomes bad science. It's the same exact science. So this is why it's also very important that we be able to um, clearly identify what science means. At, in Florida, we often had to give presentations in front of a governing board. That was the board that um, was sort of the oversight for the water management district. These were people appointed by the governor, very intelligent people, but we were always told to speak at an eighth grade level to communicate to them. Unless, of course, there was an elected official in the audience, and then you spoke at a fourth grade level. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't speak clearly, and this, there's a lot of influence in, in these areas, and Everglades, some very powerful people, you didn't want to get on the wrong side, because the consequences could be quite severe. Now, we don't have problems with alligators chasing us down, but maybe the Asian carp is on our doorstep here as well. So it still, it still um, behooves us to be able to speak clearly. So what I'd like to do is talk to you about some common problems and hopefully some solutions that we face when communicating science. And you'll see that there's quite a bit of overlap with what Dave just told us. First of all, often get criticized that science, scientists present too much data. Well, you're right. We put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into collecting those data. And by golly, you're going to see it, whether you like it or not. <laughs> And here's an example. I mean, this is actually from, this is from Muskegon Lake. It's meant for scientists, not for you. By the time, and I'm not going to walk you through this, but by the time I did, your eyes would glaze over and you'd be seeing, saying, when the hell is this going to end? Because I don't want to deal with this. So the solution is to put the information in context. We need to use the data to tell a story. This is an information pyramid, and scientists tend to operate down at the base with detailed measurements. This is where we're comfortable. We, we collect a lot of data, and we want to tell you about those data. But really, people learn information, they assimilate information, they digest information in a story. And so we need to be able to tell this information. Now, the data can help inform that story, but the larger context has to be a storyteller. And these AOCs tell great stories. Here are slides from Muskegon Lake in the middle of the 20th century. It was a cesspool. People were dumping directly into the lake. Um, you can see here's... Lakey Foundry in downtown Muskegon, and there are plumes coming out of the foundry into the lake. We were dumping directly into the lake, either through pipes or through dump trucks. Today, next slide, Matt, the lake, at least visually, looks a lot better. That's a great story. All right? Now, there's still problems in the lake. Kathy told you about them. But visually, aesthetically, the lake's come a long way, and those data can help inform them. As Dave mentioned, we like to use jargon. It's just very comfortable for us. We spent a lot of time learning that jargon. We spent a lot of time learning how to pronounce that jargon. And we want to share it with you. So for cyanobacteria, I can tell you all about these kinds of things for toxic blue-green algae, whether it's the way that, whether it's different genera, whether it's the instruments we use to collect it, the different types of toxins. 
You don't want to know all that. What you want are images. So we can give you images and hands-on tools to help explain that information. So one image would be a microscopic view of what these blue-green algae look like. This is the genus Microcystis. Under the microscope, it's a colony. It has individual cells that all form together. When you get too many colonies, you get a surface bloom, like here in Spring Lake, just a little south of us here. This is not the kind of thing you want. But this is the kind of thing that visually resonates with people, not me putting up there things like microcystin or cylindrus thermopsin. Or we can use models. This is not a computational model. This is a physical model. Some of you may be familiar with this. Enviroscapes, they're two, by, two feet by two feet. You can uh, put dye in here to show road runoff, dye coming off of farms, dye coming off of wastewater management plants. And then it, it shows how nutrients in the form of these dyes move across the landscape, eventually get into our water. And people, they migrate around this. They love this. And in fact, it might have been three or four years ago, one of the times that I was testifying in front of Jerry's committee, and I gave a slideshow talking about the aquatic problems in the state of Michigan. And I think the members were fairly engaged, but it wasn't until we broke out this model that they all gathered around and they got really, really interested. And it's just, it's amazing how humans will migrate to this as opposed to a typical slideshow where I'm just trying to throw information at you. The third problem is that we, we don't like to make generalizations. We like to caveat our findings because every one of these findings that we have is not pure. Science has uncertainty associated with it, and we want to share that uncertainty with you. And we often caveat things to death. So the solution is, again, uh, based on what Dave was saying, the public is not stupid. We have to provide the information clearly and honestly and hope that you will understand that if we present it in an effective way.